So now we're going to look at the neurotransmitter aspects of autonomic pharmacology. And we'll start with cholinergic transmission. So we're going to outline the process of getting acetylcholine to the nerve terminal. This is the presynaptic neuron. This is the postsynaptic neuron. So choline is getting transported into the presynaptic cell. And it binds with acetyl-CoA, which is coming from the mitochondria, to form acetylcholine. Acetylcholine then gets transported into a vesicle. And in order for the contents of this vesicle to be released into the synaptic cleft, two things need to happen. So the first is we have this action potential comes down and it opens this voltage-gated calcium channel and we get the influx of calcium into the cell. This is going to lead to an interaction between these proteins here. This VAMP is vesicle-associated membrane protein. SNAP is uh, synaptosome-associated protein. Synaptosome just refers to the nerve terminal here. When these guys, their collective name are called snare proteins, V-snare and T-snare, which is right here, snare proteins. This one is V-snare, this is T-snare, referring to the nerve terminal. When these guys interact, it, it, these are docking proteins, and it allows the expulsion of the neurotransmitter into the synaptic cleft. Now that acetylcholine is here, it actually does not, very last, it does not last very long. Acetylcholine esterase quickly metabolizes and is the primary determinant of the duration of action of the neurotransmitter here. And it metabolizes acetylcholine into choline and acetate. So a couple of important points here is that different drugs that we give that act like acetylcholine, they're going to have different sensitivities to this acetylcholine esterase, one. The second point here is that if we block acetylcholine esterase, this would be a very nice drug target because if we can block this, we can indirectly increase the levels of acetylcholine, specifically at nerve terminals, and thus we would increase the binding to the cholinoreceptor. And so we do have classes of drugs which do that, and those are called acetylcholine esterase inhibitors. So by inhibiting acetylcholine esterase, we increase the amount of acetylcholine. Very important point. The last important point here has to do with botulinum. The boards love botulinum. Incredibly high yield. Every couple years the FDA comes out with a new you know treatment that uses Botox. And so you know that it first started with kind of wrinkles and now it's evolved into many things and we'll get into those here in a second. But what botulinum is doing is it's an enzyme. And these snare proteins essentially wrap around this enzyme and get cleaved. And as a result, we cannot release acetylcholine into this nerve terminal. And if there is no acetylcholine, that's essentially leading to chemical deinnervation or paralysis. And so up here we have just a, a quick little note, and that is, these drugs, hemicholinium and vesemicol, these are not drugs that are used clinically. These are research drugs. And my impression and my take is you have enough things to learn. Uh, the boards have enough things to test you on that are clinically relevant. So these are not really worth wasting your mental space on. They may be an answer choice, but they won't be the correct answer. And so I made a little note of here what these snare proteins are. We're going to get, get into this in a second here, or on the next slide, but those two proteins, SNAP is the synaptosome-associated protein, and there are two of them, SNAP25 or syntaxin. So here is a, a better diagram which kind of illustrates what's going on. And here's our neuromuscular junction. Here's the axon terminal. This is the muscle cell. And so in a normal this is presynaptic, this is postsynaptic, this is the synaptic cleft. In a normal neuron, we have these vesicles which have acetylcholine in it, and we have a vesicle-associated membrane protein. This is a V-snare, and the name of that one is synaptobrevin. And then we have this terminal-associated membrane protein, or a synaptosome-associated membrane protein, SNAP, 
I'm sorry, synapisome-associated protein. And when these guys bind, it allows the docking of the vesicle and the release of acetylcholine. And so what Botox is doing is it's an enzyme. It is cleaving these proteins, right? This was syntaxin and SNAP25 that it cleaved. Here we see it cleaved uh, synaptobrevin. And as a result, this vesicle cannot dock to the cleft. And, you know, the one way the boards might test this is with the drug Botox. The other way they might test this is that you know, they'll say an adult eats canned vegetables. That should be a tip-off that they're talking about uh, Clostridium botulinum, which is the bacterium, the anaerobic bacterium which causes, which, which creates this toxin. The other susceptible individual here is the baby that eats unpasteurized or raw honey. Now before we get into, you know, the uses for Botox, if this doesn't make sense to you, here's another way that I like to think about it. So here we have the docking of SpaceX Dragon's capsule to the International Space Station. And the reason I bring this up is that these are docking proteins. So imagine here that, well, here's our space station. It has this robotic arm that reaches out and grabs the, uh, this is the Dragon capsule. And so this capsule kind of represents, in my mind, the vesicle. There's an attachment spot on this vesicle, which allows this robotic arm to attach to it and eventually dock that we can see here. So this would be the V-snare protein. The robotic arm is the T-snare protein. And let's just assume that the International Space Station is the nerve terminal. So what Botox is doing is essentially cleaving this guy here so that the vesicle cannot bind and attach to the space station or the nerve terminal, whatever. So what are some uses of Botox? So remember here, we've covered this earlier, Botox is releasing acetylcholine everywhere. It's at the nicotinic and the muscarinic receptors. And I just randomly pulled this article online just to show you that you will find articles that are very recent, very frequently uh, regarding Botox. And so in terms of blocking the nicotinic receptors, well, those are affecting places where there are muscles. So cosmetically, this is the number one cosmetic procedure done in the United States to decrease wrinkles. Also, will decrease muscle spasticity. So people with cervical dystonia who kind of, they uh, are constantly having spasms of their neck and shoulder muscles. Blepharospasm are the involuntary eye closures kind of rapidly. Or strabismus, lazy eye. And in this case, they would inject it into the good eye in order to give the other eye opportunity to get stronger. In each one of those cases, they're injecting this into skeletal muscles. But other places we know that acetylcholine works is also at those muscarinic receptors. So for a patient who has hyperhidrosis, which is a very embarrassing problem where they just sweat excessively at their armpits or at their palms, um, a local injection of Botox not only will last for several months, but it, it will incredibly decrease the amount of activity at those sweat glands. And the most recent approval by the FDA is the use of Botox for bladder overactivity. Uh, in patients who have a spinal cord injuries, or there's actually a ton of uses here, but if you have this overactive bladder, and remember the acetylcholine binds to the bladder and causes contraction, if we can reduce that cholinergic transmission, we will help alleviate a lot of those terribly irritating symptoms. So Botox, very high yield topic. What we're gonna do next is talk about adrenergic transmission.